Today, it is our extraordinary privilege to be speaking with Dr. George Marsden. Dr. Marsden is the Francis A. McEnany Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Notre Dame and also the co-editor of the text that we'll be discussing today, Evangelicals, Who They Have Been, Are Now, and Could Be. Dr. Marsden, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Dr. Marsden, in some ways, this book is an attempt to make sense of the Trump election when it was reported that 81% of white evangelicals voted for President Trump. You and your distinguished co-editors, Mark Knoll and David Bebbington, stand today as the preeminent historians of evangelicalism. Uh, when is it that you decided to get together and co-edit this text? Well, we, we were all hearing lots of uh, complaints and alarm from uh, various of our evangelical colleagues who were upset about <clears throat> uh, the way evangelicalism was be, being equated with a political movement rather than with a religious identity. And, and the pundits were jumping from 81% of white evangelicals to just 81% of evangelicals, and as though that was the only thing that one needed to know uh, about an evangelical. So the uh, lots of people were posting things, writing things, saying, can I still use the word evangelical? Uh, is, is it uh, okay to be an evangelical? What's going to happen to the image of evangelical? Will young people start fleeing from evangelicalism because of, of this election. So uh, we were getting a lot of questions, seeing a lot of questions, so we thought it, would, it might be useful to gather the best expertise we could in order to say what is an evangelical, what has been an evangelical, and uh, can the term be uh, separated from, from its political connotation that it happens to have in the United States right now. Was this a new experience for uh, the term evangelical after the Trump election? Were there other times in the last decade or two when evangelical leaders became leery of the use of that term in public? I, I, I think when, when the uh, religious right began with Jerry Falwell in, in around 1980, and uh, again, there, there are, uh, there's, there's lots of rank and file evangelical support, but uh, lots of other evangelicals who were concerned about uh, making that a political identity so that uh, I remember back in the 1980s, one of my colleagues came up to me and said, uh, I want to resign from being an evangelical, but I don't know where to send the letter. This is no headquarters. And uh, so, so this isn't the first time that there has, has been that uh, concern. And the problem is, how do you have a religious movement that has some political responsibility, but to, at the same time doesn't uh, preempt the identity of the movement. The Washington Post reported that a meeting took place at Wheaton College in 2018. The article title is, quote, dozens of evangelical leaders meet to discuss how Trump era has unleashed, quote, grotesque caricature, unquote, of their faith. That was released on April 16, 2018. Was there any series of meetings or um, personal meetings that took place behind the scenes in the production of this text? Not Really, I think Mark Knoll was at that Wheaton meeting, and Mark is the principal editor of this volume. He did the work we uh, we we helped, but 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 it's mostly his uh, his production. And I, I think he was there. I think uh, Timothy Keller, who's in the book, uh, was at that meeting as was one of the participants. But we didn't hold any particular meeting. Uh, we just, uh, uh, I, I, I think, uh, there was, a, a, yeah, I, I think we just saw each other and, and or, or were in communication with each other and said, look, there needs to be some sort of statement uh, on this, or can we help clarify this as, as historians who've been working on it for a long time. Dr. Marston, 
Uh, was there ever a time when evangelicalism referred to a movement with clear doctrinal definition? I mean, it, no, actually, no. It, it, it's not a movement like uh, Presbyterian that has a confession of faith and, and an exact doctrinal definition. It's, it's a movement that, that, that grew out of uh, renewal movements in Christendom beginning in the uh, 1700s of revivals and the Great Awakening in this country, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, people like that, the Pietist movement in, in Germany. Uh, and what happened was that various kinds of Protestants found that uh, there was a certain style of Christianity that would work to awaken people to uh, the heart of the gospel. The Methodist movement was a big uh, part of it. And you have these hymns of Charles Wesley uh, expressing the, the depths of the, of the gospel message. And that caught on uh, and not as an organized movement so much as a, as a series of renewal movements that had a number of things in common. And they were all uh, Protestant and had a, a strong emphasis on the Bible alone as an authority. They all emphasized conversion, that you needed to be converted to uh, to Christ from and, and give up your sinful sinful ways either, either as, as a dramatic experience or as a longer term experience but you had to you had to be converted and uh, that had to be on the basis of the atoning work of Jesus and then uh, that style of evangelicalism generated a lot of uh, energy to go out and tell other people the missionary movement modern missionary movement grew out of that. Uh, revival movements and all sorts of organizations uh, to uh, evangelize and also to uh, do uh, good works. The, the, the anti-slavery movement grew out of uh, evangelicalism and, and uh, other uh, social reform movements, uh, prohibition movement, uh, Sabbatarian movements, uh, across the across the board, not not any one political uh, identity, but uh, working to demonstrate the faith. There's also a tremendous number of charitable movements uh, have have grown out of uh, evangelicalism. So it's a it's a collection of movements that have a lot in common, a common gospel, but it's inform it's very informal, very loose. And, and, and tends to, you know, it's, it's very difficult to organize or to rein in in any particular way. In, in your view, Dr. Marsden, is the present form of evangelicalism looser than it has been in the past, or is the current character of evangelicalism largely reflective of its historic nature? It's a little looser maybe than it was. Um, there, it, if I think back to um, 50, 60 years ago, when I was first starting out, um, I used to say that an evangelical is someone who likes Billy Graham. And that worked pretty well as an identity for, for evangelicals. There were, there were liberals on the one side who didn't like Billy Graham, thought he was too fundamentalist. And there were fundamentalists on the other side who thought Billy Graham was too liberal. But there was a big group of people of, of all sorts of uh, races and denominations and, uh, and around the world that like Billy Graham. And so there, there, there seemed to be a sort of center in evangelicalism. And uh, so that like the World Lausanne movement in the 70s uh, developed as a coalition of people who saw that they had this in common and people like John Stott uh, came in, or uh, see, you had an interview with Samuel Escobar. Uh, those people, very different people, different parts of the world, different uh, emphases, nonetheless, see them, saw themselves as ha having a lot in common. Uh, and there is still a good bit of that, but the uh, making evangelicalism identical to a particular political identity. 
uh, built a barrier uh, between the people who have that political identity and the people who don't. And also uh, it builds, uh, if, if, it, if it's white evangelicals, in contrast, for instance, to African-American evangelicals, even in America, it, it builds a wall between two kinds of evangelicals who, who uh, have a lot in common theologically. They believe the same Bible, believe in Jesus, conversion, speak much of the same language, but uh, the po politics divides them. So, so uh, making politics the, the primary identity seems to be one of the things that disrupts that sense of unity that people might have otherwise. Thank you very much for that reflection. Dr. Marsden, in the opening chapter of the book, quote, The Evangelical Denomination is the chapter title, you write, Evangelicalism, then, despite its diversities, is properly spoken of as a single movement in at least two different ways. It is a broader movement somewhat unified by common heritages, influences, problems, and tendencies. It is also a conscious fellowship, coalition, community, family, or feudal system of friends and rivals who have some stronger sense of belonging together. That's on page 29 of the text. This chapter first appeared in 1984 as an introduction to your book, Evangelicalism in Modern America. What are the most significant ways that evangelicalism has changed, maybe since 1984? Yes, uh, it's, uh, I mean, those things are still true about evangelicalism, that it is a, a particular religious identity, but it's, a, but, but it's a loose identity like, say, Protestantism that doesn't, if you say you're a Protestant, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to agree with everything that someone else says, but, but there was, uh, as I said, I think back then there was a little more sense of uh, identity with a, a, a group of people that there were rivals, and I, I used the term like the feudal system, that the feudal system was a, a, a series of uh, uh, empires, uh, of, of local Local empires, local lords had their own little bailiwick, and 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 when they're fighting against a common enemy, they could they could be brought together. But then sometimes they're 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 competing with, uh, with with each other. So it's it's always been a, a, a very mixed identity. And, and but but again, I think uh, what has changed is the uh, the degree to which. Uh, there, there's a political barrier among certain groups in the United States. That's not so much true in, in other parts of the world. Are there traits of evangelicalism that make the movement particularly vulnerable to politicization? Yes, uh, that, that's a good question. Evangelicalism is market-driven, and, and that's the genius of it, that, that the early revivalists realized that we can awaken people in the churches by using new techniques and, and new ways of preaching and new songs and uh, w uh, ways of communicating the, the, the gospel. And they, they borrowed from each other. So that rather than there being a church hierarchy who says, well, you have to use this, this liturgy and this set of hymns, what happened was uh, a, a certain way of preaching or a certain kind of hymn just would catch on. So, so you would have across the movement people doing the same sorts of things because they, 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 they worked. I'm reminded uh, some years ago, uh, my, my local church was uh, trying to get to know uh, an African-American church nearby better. And it was a, a, a AME uh, African-American Methodist Church, and we attended the evening service. The order of service and the songs we sang were almost the same as in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church I, I grew up in. No connection at all, but these things just were, were there in common in, in the movement. And I think you can find that all over the world. You'll find the same kinds of of singing and so forth. So it's very market driven. So to get to your question, 
being market driven it's also dependent on the audience a lot and if the audience has certain political prejudices or affiliations or dispositions it doesn't really change those that if if you come in and you're too prophetic and say you have to think this way about the political system and everyone else in the in the community thinks a different way they're just going to go to another church so so evangelicalism doesn't have a lot of political leverage over people who aren't already inclined to to think politically the way they they they, they do at the conclusion of the book you write this this is on page 282, quote, If we think rather of evangelicalism from a global perspective as a diverse but related set of worldwide religious movements with historical roots going back centuries, then does it not seem sadly American-centered to give up on the term and even the whole movement just because of widespread confusion of religious with political categories in our part of the world? I would argue rather that the term evangelical will still be around as a useful designation for a large and varied category of Christians long after Trump is gone, assuming that the human race survives that long. In your view, what are the, uh, the most uh, important key ingredients that give this global evangelicalism its cohesion. Yes, and when when I uh, talked about that, I was thinking of this analogy that uh, evangelicalism is a is a broad category, and it might be you might think of it as like the category of mammals in in biology. Uh, there, there, there's mammals all have certain kinds of things in common. But then there are very different species of mammals. There's elephants and there's mice and uh, there, there's humans and, and, and there's cats and, and so forth. So <clears throat> that uh, identifying all <clears throat> evangelicals on the basis of white American evangelicals is like identifying all uh, mammals uh, as, as being like cats or, or, or dogs or whatever, but whatever you think of. And so that if you shift away from the American-centered perspective to a world perspective, then white American evangelicals, and, uh, evangelicals are one group. But even in America, there, there, there's lots of other evangelicals. There's lots of Asian evangelicals, lots of Hispanic evangelicals, African-American evangelicals. Uh, and, and so forth. So all I'm saying is we shouldn't get so obsessed with our own political concerns that we lose uh, what's been a perfectly good term and, and, and a term that represents a movement that goes back at least several centuries. And, and if we don't use that term, we're going to have to invent uh, another one to, uh, to identify people, groups that are related, interrelated to each other by that movement. Dr. Marsden, thank you very much for that reflection. And as we look out to the next election cycle, what is your hope for the future of evangelicalism? I do think that there is an issue uh, in, in the United States of perception of evangelical uh, that um, 60, 70 years ago, Billy Graham would say, all we need to do is to get enough people converted to Christianity in this nation and we will turn it around and make it better. And even Jerry Falwell was saying, we need to have a moral majority. Uh, and But now a lot of people are looking at evangelicals, people who are not white evangelicals, so look at it and say, those people are not taking care of the poor, not taking care of the stranger, whatever the good reasons they might have for, for that. Uh, they, a lot of people are, are seeing that not as a, a exemplary morality, but rather identifying whatever gets them uh, political power. And so my hope is that uh, at least some evangelicals will uh, will reject that kind of politicized identity and, and, and be willing to, uh, to, to say we need, 
you know, we need an identity that transcends politics. And I, I think a good principle is if your political identity isn't different than the identity of a secular political party, then you, you ought to re-examine it in terms of your Christian principles and say, I like some things in one party and I like some things in the other party and don't be uh, a partisan who then uh, subordinates your religious affiliation to your, your partisan political identity. Dr. Marsden, if I may close with a question that I've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church today to be united? How would we recognize this unity? And what is it that we can do as Christians today to uh, work for the unity that Jesus prayed in John 17? Well, I, I think keep praying. I think the kind of thing that, that, that you appear to be doing is, is, is what needs to be done that uh, need to be looking for commonality rather than differences. And, and, and I think humans have a tendency because of human sinfulness to, to look for differences that, that make our group better than your group uh, rather than having a, a sense of generosity toward those that, 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 that differ from you. And uh, you need to be emphasizing what's essential in the gospel and what are things that are, are secondary and, and, and non-essential. And if, you, and if you try to dwell on the essentials, then you see you have a lot more in common uh, with lots of people all over the world uh, and Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and others, as well as other, as, as other kinds of Protestants that you have much more in common with them if, if you're looking at the basic things of Christianity than, than you do with people uh, who are thoroughly secular, whether they're conservative or liberal or whatever. It's been our tremendous pleasure today to be speaking with Dr. George Marsden, Francis A. McAnany, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Notre Dame and the co-editor of the text that we've been discussing today, Evangelicals, who they have been, are now, and could be. Dr. Marsden, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it.